Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Investor Talk series that we hold uh, thanks to our partners uh, ACCA uh, and uh, Global Tech Summit. Uh, we're uh, hosting this talk and this is mostly towards uh, women entrepreneurship. So we uh, think that the state of entrepreneurship and the state of women entrepreneurship are one and the same, uh, but that isn't always the case. Uh, for women, wide involvement in the business world is still relatively new uh, and they continue to face their own unique challenges. Uh, and barriers to entrepreneurship. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with introducing uh, our guests uh, and our panelists for today. So we are joined by Rabil. Uh, he's an MIT grad. He's gained his professional experience in London. Uh, he's worked in investment banking and in Morgan Stanley. Uh, he followed up with some private equity experience at GIC. He's the founder of Sarmaya Car, which has invested in Prochek, Batari, Dot and Line Center, by Kia, and more. Uh, so. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ravi. Thank you for having me. Uh, next up is uh, Kilsoom. Um, obviously needs no introduction. Uh, she started uh, her company, I2I, in 2011, uh, which is, uh, I, I believe, nine years from now. Uh, so I2I supports startups and the broader eco, uh, entrepreneur ecosystem in developing markets uh, and this uh, began in Pakistan. Uh, Kilsum also is uh, the founder for I2I Ventures which invests in um, uh, a lot of high growth uh, Pakistani startups. Um, thank you for joining us Kilsum. Uh, Kilsum is joining us from the US so it's quite early. <laughs> Not that early. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, we uh, and uh, lastly, we have uh, Khurram Zafar Saab, who is uh, the f I mean the founder for Center for Entrepreneurship, which is now uh, the National Incubation Center Lahore. Uh, he's always advised the federal and Punjab government in matters related to higher education, investments, innovation, and the startup ecosystem. He's also on the board of uh, Prime Minister's Task Force uh, for Tech Driven Knowledge Economy. Uh, and is the founding partner and country director for 47 Ventures, a VC firm dedicated to invest in Pakistan. Uh, thank you for um, joining us. Uh, for the... Thank you, Ad. Thanks for having me. All right. uh, so um, I'd like to start off uh, my first question um, with uh, um, Kulsum, who has been working uh, with women entrepreneurs and uh, in general uh, with a lot of aunt, and she was uh, uh, running I2I Ventures and she started in 2011, uh, where the, uh, woman, the climate for uh, women entrepreneurs uh, was quite different than what we know uh, today. And uh, I believe we've had a lot of positive changes uh, and uh, there are a lot to you now as well. So uh, Kulsum, uh, in your experiences uh, in running I2I, I2I Ventures, uh, and working with all these entrepreneurs uh, for the past nine or 10 years, uh, how do you think the investment clim climate for women entrepreneurs has changed in the past five years? Um, and what do you predict will happen in the next five to 10 years? Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me and Samikum, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, it's, I, we just, we released research in November with the World Bank and it was actually funded by WeFi, which is the Women's Entrepreneurial Finance Initiative. Um, so we specifically looked at the gender lens um, when assessing the Pakistan startup ecosystem. And so our research team actually collected data on deal flow over the last five years. And what's really interesting is I think it was about 101 deals um, that we collected. About 24 of them um, were invested in women-led companies, but actually only three 3% when we look at it, I think it was about over a little over $170 million um, that's been invested in the ecosystem in five years, only about 3% of it was towards women led companies. So even though the quantum of deals was about 24, the amount was actually quite small. So I think what's been interesting um, based on our research, as well as just our own experience, um, our accelerators had over 60% of our companies have been women led companies. Obviously our fund doesn't only invest in women led companies, but we do have a lens towards that. Um, so what I think is interesting is that we're seeing overall, we're seeing just the increase in the amount of deals um, in women-led companies, but we've generally seen investments in women that tend to happen at the pre-seed or seed level and very few, if any, that are at series A. And so there's a need to um, 
overall increase the funnel, which I think is really important, but also to really think about how women who are raising investment are also graduating to later stages. So we're seeing it get better. Um, we're seeing overall the numbers get better, the funnel get better, but I think it just requires a lot of intentional support um, that really needs to happen. And we're seeing a lot of efforts like that in the ecosystem. And I've definitely seen and, and taken part and participated in that in the last five years. Um, but overall just needs to, you know, we need to be thinking about inclusion at all ends, at all, every part, whether or not you're on the support side, investing, um, or any part of the ecosystem, we need to be thinking about that. Oh, you're on mute, Ahad. Yeah, thank you, Kulsum. Um, I would like uh, the same question to be answered by um, Khuram Saab, since he's also on the board of uh, Karandas and uh, can give us the perspective in which Karandas has heavily invested in women entrepreneurship as well. Uh, so in the past years, uh, how has he seen uh, the change and what does he expect in the next five years? Right, Ahad, with... Um at Karandas, we actually have a specific, very specific mandate to invest in women-led businesses. And it's, um, uh, as per that mandate, we have invested in about uh, 66 or so women entrepreneurs uh, over the past couple of years. And out of the 66, the investment has been in various forms. It has been um, in the form of grants for about a dozen or so entrepreneurs or grants who are um, uh, smallish, maybe, uh, you know, an average ticket size of a, about a million or so. <coughs> uh, then we have uh, about a dozen startups, uh, maybe more, around 18 or so, that got uh, on average around 15 million in terms of, in as uh, convertible loans. And then uh, we've had another, uh, I would say, um, well, in fact, all of the, the startups, the 60, 66 startups or so, uh, they've uh, all got business support and services in various shapes and forms, uh, ranging from, uh, you know, getting the company or business formalized, um, working with SCP, with lawyers, with uh, tax experts, uh, various business service providers, to get the companies registered with SCP, to get the books formalized, um, to get their business documented, um, to help them prepare for pitches to investors, uh, to uh, getting them support from uh, one of the big five consulting firms to uh, prepare investment memos for them. So the, the, you know, the scope of investment has been um, you know, very large from business support services to grants to convertible debt. Um, I think, uh, if uh, don't quote me on this, but roughly around anywhere from 300 to 400 million rupees has been invested in solely women-led businesses from uh, the Karandas platform uh, to date. So, I mean, that's one example of an organization that specifically has a mandate uh, to invest in women-led businesses. And, and, and I must uh, say that uh, we're presently surprised when you actually uh, sort of go out looking for women-led businesses, you actually find a lot, very passionate, uh, hardworking women entrepreneurs that are running some amazing businesses. So now we are at a state where some of these businesses have grown and scaled up and uh, perhaps can you know, get some equity investment from the CIC side of uh, the Cardinals business uh, or us from 47 Ventures or uh, Stamayaka or I2I uh, and the like. It's certainly a mature ecosystem, it's evolving. Um, it was uh, very nascent, I would say two years ago, three years ago, but it's, uh, it's maturing now. Thank you, Kurum. I mean, um, that does show that Canada has invested a lot of money um, into women entrepreneurship and to support them. Uh, Rabil, uh, you've been in the Pakistani ecosystem now for quite a while and seen a lot of startups grow. You've seen, you're seeing the ecosystem grow. Uh, how do you think uh, has uh, the investment climate or uh, the women participation or the quality of women entrepreneurs, uh, what, how, how have you seen, seen them grow uh, and what do you see with the current um, uh, initiatives being taken by the government and by different organizations. Uh, what do you see, uh, where do you see women uh, entrepreneurial businesses going? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the two real champions of like moving our ecosystem forward are uh, the two fellow panelists that I have, um, of course, Kalsum championing um, the, the women card, even though I think uh, 
more broadly, if you look at the ecosystem, uh, we've come by leaps and bounds of just over the last couple of years as well. And, and while that has um, a, a rising tide effect all across, um, I think there, is, there are also some um, deeper trends which uh, we're also trying to kind of like, you know, um, if you want to call them jump on the bandwagon or, or rightfully so, um, trying to leapfrog uh, certain other challenges that we've seen in other ecosystems. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, um, uh, having more women uh, participate in being uh, entrepreneurs, uh, leaders, um, and not just like in a particular kind of like in a pigeonholing, um, even in terms of their skill set or um, uh, in terms of like, you know, the, the choice of industry in which they want to end up. One thing interesting that I actually just picked up recently is um, uh, Pakistan has a disproportionately large representation of female um, game developers. Uh, I mean, it's something which is uh, interesting as one would when weighing up like, you know, what the different options are um, available to young graduates. Uh, it's interesting and encouraging to hear something of that sort. Um, so I, I feel like in addition to that overall uh, mega trend uh, of the ecosystem progressing uh, uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen um, even further progress, I would say, uh, with respect to um, um, women being particularly involved in both you know, facilitating and, and in uh, making that ecosystem progress happen, um, but also in creating opportunities. And I think um, in addition to just Karandas um, that Khurram shared, um, there's also been this Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, which um, Kalsum has also been, I know, involved through um, like in you know, both the research capacity and, and finding out um, what should really be the basis of any decision around this as well, which is data. Um, and, and we've uh, also, as Sarmayakar, um, also been involved in that capacity in that we have a specific commitment um, from the IFC as the implementing partner of that uh, initiative to direct capital towards uh, women-led and women-founded uh, companies and startups. And, um, and that is something that even we are measured against. So, so that sort of formalization, um, which has happened with our fund, was something that uh, we as an ecosystem hadn't experienced before. Um, and it's uh, incredibly encouraging uh, because any of those businesses, which if they end up scaling, are going to attract a lot more capital. Um, and so we're also going to see hopefully a bridging of this gap of capital that within this space also gets diverted more towards um, uh, businesses that are led by uh, men as opposed to female. Um, whereas if you look at the returns that are generated, the data would uh, suggest that we should be uh, weighting it on the other side. Um, so of course, it's also not something that can be addressed by a magic wand, but there's been both a professionalization overall of the ecosystem. And within this, I think also with led by champions like Kulsum and, and Huram and others in the ecosystem, um, getting more and more females involved. Uh, but I think of course, there are some cultural um, uh, barriers that uh, we need to also overcome, which uh, continue to weigh uh, a lot of these opportunities down. I mean, um, uh, this is uh, this is the first time I'm hearing that uh, the fund uh, that you have actually put allocated aside um, some money for women founders. I mean, this is excellent news for uh, women entrepreneurs out there, and, and an excellent initiative which should, I think, uh, believe be embedded into a lot of other. Uh, uh, VCs uh, or even private equity companies, uh, <laughs> if they find uh, women-led CEOs. Uh, so, uh, I mean, um, then uh, knowing from this, there's a lot of con common misconceptions uh, that women founders have. Um, some of those misconceptions include um, uh, that they're uh, just because they're a woman, they might not get funded. Uh, they would not know where to get the funds from, or maybe uh, looking at a VC and uh, then expecting uh, everything out of that VC. And if they don't invest, uh, obviously they're heartbroken. Um, and that, that happens, I mean, with every gender, but uh, mm -hmm. these are some misconceptions that everybody has. Um, as uh, and, and I mean, uh, we've seen them uh, with a lot of founders that we work with uh, as an incubator and accelerator. Um, 
in what in your uh, kalsum what do you think how how is it that we can combat these differences uh, and um uh, make them feel um, that these are these are just misconceptions and uh, communicate with them more effectively so i mean i actually agree i don't actually agree that they're all misconceptions i actually think there's a misconception and there's the reality right so globally there's been research done about the types of questions that uh female founders are asked versus uh companies led by men and I've experienced this fundraising for our fund is that um, women tend to get asked risk related questions and men tend to get asked aspirational questions and that only matters because the more aspirational questions that you get asked that much I think it's six times the likelihood of you actually receiving funding right so there is a misconception sometimes when it's like you know oftentimes what I've seen is that uh, women don't put themselves in a position of you know wanting you know I think what we what we tend to see is that um, um, and um, no offense to the men in the room, but this is based on actual data, is that men tend to oversell or say something about like, you know, what they're about to do. So aspirationally really good at framing themselves versus what we've seen with data is that women will always sell what they're doing, which is I think really good, but sometimes tends to hurt them in the process of when they're fundraising. And so the difficult thing is that women often have to take on the labor of turning um, risk related questions into aspirational answers. And that's not something that comes naturally to most people. So I know that even for myself, I've had to personally train myself to how to how to do that in conversations um, in in with funders for our fund, right? In terms of actually turning something to seem aspirational, even though I was being asked a risk related question. And so it's a question of not just the misconception of, um, you know, what the things that women get asked and why they don't get funding. There's a real reality there in terms of unconscious bias that exists that that is underlying of why people get asked risk related questions. But it's also a training for women to actually say, okay, how do we turn this around? How do we actually frame this in an aspirational way? How do we actually also change the mindset? So oftentimes we've had founders, um, some, and again, some of our best founders have been women. Our companies have raised over $7 million and 90% of that has been by our female led companies, right? And from our accelerator side and that's not all been investment related money right and Garandaz was actually a big support for some of our companies having been able to raise money but some of them have raised grants and all sorts of funding and that also speaks to the ecosystem as well right because another thing that I would say is that it's actually a misconception that what that every company regardless if you're led by a man or a woman that you should have to raise VC funding right so venture capital funding is a completely different type of class of money it speaks to very high growth types of businesses we really want to see that hockey stick growth and that's not always a fit for every kind of company that's raising and so I, another really big thing to think about for the future is less about the misconception on the female side but also the diversity that's needed on the funding side right not every type of uh, company that needs to raise funding should have to go to a VC but there should be you know revenue based financing is a great example ventured at there's an, a lot of there's a different type of diversity that we'll need in the future of the Pakistani startup ecosystem to make it more diverse to also appeal to the diversity that exists even as female-led companies are coming up. And so I think it's, you know, there are things that are the reality here, which I think is really important. And even when I was speaking about a founder that we've had, um, you know, she was building a company that was incredible and didn't even realize the potential that she had because she had undersold herself for so long. So sometimes it's a psychological mindset issue that needs real coaching. And I say this as another female founder, but as someone who's worked with women founders for over over a decade now, um, that it really takes that type of qualitative, um, you know, mindset shift sometimes that needs to happen too. Uh, those are some excellent points covered by you, Kalsum. Uh, then what do you think uh, is the number one way uh, in which we could make a substantial difference? Uh, a, as incubators, B, uh, as people in the investment ecosystem. Uh, and this question, if you could answer this, Kalsum, and then I'd like a few comments from, uh, from South and Rabin. Sure. So Ahad, you're actually taking play, the part in a, a workshop that we're running this week with the World Bank. Um, so we're working with Village Capital um, and is and supported by the World Bank and specifically the WeFi program to train entrepreneurship support organizations on investment readiness for female-led companies and on growth. Um, and that's one big thing, right, is that there is a gap that exists. How do we actually help close that gap, first of all? Because in the study that we released in November, 75% of the investors that we interviewed said 
said that they did not see a difference in the quality between male-led companies and companies led by women or diverse teams, but the issue was that they didn't see enough of them, right? So first of all, number one, how do we, how do we increase the funnel altogether? So that's one thing that we're working on right now, um, and you're one of Team Up and NIC Asamba. Actually, all the NICs are part of um, that training that we're doing right now. And then, and actually, business incubation centers, all of them will be part of that over the, uh, over the next uh, month or two. But then secondly, also, how do we actually bridge the gap between deals that are investment worthy but not investment ready? And I think that's something that we see is that oftentimes you'll see female-led companies, but they still need a lot of work to actually get to a stage um, that they can raise investment. And then also, how do we diversify the funding sources that exist, right? Because if only we have angels and we have investment funds, and obviously Garanda is an outlier in that in terms of the types of terms and types of funding they provide to female-led companies, how can we also maybe internationally increase the diversity of funding sources so that more women-led companies can raise funding in the future? Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thank you for uh, the comments on this. Uh, um, what in your opinion is uh, one of one thing that we can do uh, that can substantially make a difference uh, in uh, increasing women entrepreneurship and providing them funding opportunities uh, and generally uh, solving the ecosystem for them or the, making it more soft for them? Well, I think uh, Kulsum has uh, said it uh, very nicely. So I um, uh, reiterate everything that she has said. Uh, I think one thing that will help a lot, and uh, she alluded to that, um, uh, in our comments also, is that we see investors, we, you know, we over time, we tend to get uh, very lazy. So a lot of the deals that we're looking at are deals that are, you know, coming our way or are in our vicinity, in Lahore, for example, 47 Ventures. We miss out on a lot of opportunities in Karachi and Islamabad and Pindi, Peshawar, Lotusan. Um, so I think one role that incubation centers can play is uh, because, you know, you're out there, you're in touch with, you know, uh, I don't know about NIC, uh, in uh, Islamabad, but uh, NSC Lahore, for example, it does a lot of outreach activities. So that's a very good opportunity to source women-led businesses and bring them into the fold and provide them that initial training that Kulsum is talking about. Um, and, and to you know get them to a stage where at least uh, they have access to uh, the investors in some of these larger cities. So I think that's probably, if, if you were to ask me uh, one single thing above and beyond what consumers already stated, is uh, help in uh, scouting women-led entrepreneurs um, everywhere you go for your scouting activities and bring them into the fold and making them, you know, introducing them to the entrepreneurship ecosystem. You know, somebody could be a great entrepreneur in Faisalabad, the Wazirabad, the Gujranwala, Sialkot, um, you know, Peshawar, and uh, we generally don't have access to it. One data point that I can share with you is um, there's, uh, I, I certainly agree about increasing the, the top of the funnel. Um, if I were to look, I haven't done a, a you know, very uh, proper analysis, but just I think from uh, memory, uh, there must be over 200 or so uh, investment memos that we have received from our website. And uh, I don't think I'd be very off if I were to say that maybe 10, 12 of them were women-led businesses. The rest were all male-led businesses. So I think that ratio ought to change uh, because, because that sort of manifests itself as you are as you're sort of walking down the funnel. So obviously, you know, the same ratio sort of comes out assuming everybody is equally uh, good entrepreneurs. In fact, I believe women are, uh, you know, better entrepreneurs than men. But the numbers that's, number that's entering the funnel is so small that uh, uh, you know what we see on the other end is you know relatively uh, a very small number. So I think you can help a lot with scouting. Perfect. I agree. Uh, I agree, from Sab. Uh, we do need to work a lot on the um, the, the germination side of things uh, before they're even incubated, uh, and as such, we need to work a lot with uh, the universities. Uh, Rabi, uh, what is it that you uh, think can make a difference? That one thing. So um, my my response is both going to be a little bit of an extension of what uh, was very eloquently put by Kurim Saab and Kulsum, but also maybe a little bit of a tangent given um, uh, the space we uh, are like you know we take the small space in an ecosystem which is uh, based around the investment um, side. Um, on on that one, I think uh, what we also need to look into is is really building and developing. 
um, the next generation of um, of VCs um, or or not necessarily just like you know the top one person who's founded, but also just like you know the management there, uh, and and I think that's where um, some of the uh, help uh, that comes also in changing mindsets, in in encouragement, in channeling to the right partners um, can all be done by incubators, accelerators at that stage. Um, and again, going back to what is really the purpose of, of this panel as well is, is how, do you, how do you better match um, uh, sources of capital, which um, I'm sure everyone on this panel will agree are, are screaming that they want to find these women-led businesses because it has been proven by data that they actually tend to also be very good managers and, and entrepreneurs and, and all of that. So, so how do you channel some of that um, towards them? And I think that's really where um, having women um, um, like financiers or venture capitalists, and again, we have um, the leading one in, in our country kind of sitting next to them. We have Mina, who's also a very actively involved MISPA, who's Kusum's partner. I think the more we have um, um, those people also looking to enter this space um, as uh, that career choice, um, and within that, improving both their own understanding um, and, and being able to help other women entrepreneurs um, that are starting their journeys to be able to navigate those journeys better, uh, I think is something that we also need to aspire to as an ecosystem. And, uh, and I think that's something which really um, starts um, as early as, one of, as possible. And given the important role that incubators and accelerators are, are playing in seeing that fresh crop of graduates come through, uh, new teams get created, like, you know, the, those rough, um, like, you know, gems effectively. Um, I think that's really where it becomes very important and crucial uh, to not be able to, you know, like, you know, necessarily force fit a match, um, but uh, still be able to recognize talent and be able to direct them in, in the right way, which doesn't take money, with, but it just takes investment, um, investment of time and, uh, and it requires care, et cetera. So that's just a very broad message to incubators and accelerators. Um, but I think we all can play our own small roles. Um, and so for, for example, something that we were very conscious of as our team um, has just uh, grown, was um, for us to address the gender balance in, in the investment function that we have. And, and so um, that was a very conscious kind of attempt and um, we were um, quite uh, lucky to find very, uh, quite a few talented uh, female um, finance professionals or aspiring finance uh, professionals. And um, I think that's something that at least in our own limited sphere, we're looking to do already. I mean that's excellent. These are the ones that will grow um, and grow with grow with a lot of experience and be those professionals out there that would be the guiding stars for uh, other female uh, professionals that would want to be in the investment ecosystem. Uh, so great initiative uh, there, Rabi. Uh, what we've done at the NIC is uh, to address the germinations thing and the leadership uh, is we've started a program called Found Her. Uh, we're also so so we've just launched the program uh, which we only focus towards uh, uh, women entrepreneurs and um, if they're going to have uh, different curriculum sessions with whatever uh, investment support that they need uh, getting them investment ready for you guys uh, so uh, another another part that uh, i have is um, uh, in, in in the pakistani uh, um, investment ecosystem uh, how uh, did this? Uh, how do you think that the market ecosystem is uh, that the market is working in, um, and is how is effective in increasing uh, women's economic participation and in creating environment uh, employment uh, apart from the startups? Uh, I mean, obviously uh, in SMEs in SG, SGBs. Um, if, if if you could. Uh, Start Khurram Saab and then maybe Kitsum can uh, comment and then Rabi. I'm sorry, I just, just to understand the question, you're saying how can we have more uh, uh, GPs, w women GPs? Is that what you said? So, so, so my question uh, basically was apologies uh, for that. I just repeated to you: is uh, the uh, investment mar the, the market? Uh, how effective is the market investment market uh, in increasing women's economic participation 
and in creating employment. So this is not just for uh, the innovation-driven enterprises that we work with as NICs, but also uh, the different uh, other uh, SMEs or SGBs in general. Uh, Okay, well, so um, there are obviously, you know, cultural, um, you know, challenges that women face in a country like Pakistan. Uh, but, uh, you know, by the time women entrepreneurs sort of, uh, you know, get to a stage where they're ready to raise money, they've already sort of demonstrated that they have the resourcefulness and the will and the, uh, and the passion to sort of not care about that and sort of rise above all of that. and uh, and be at par with any, any other businessman in the country. So um, I, I don't know if any uh, sort of uh, uh, non-cultural uh, barriers that exist in terms of uh, access to market or uh, regulations or law or uh, anything like that. Uh, I think it's just uh, uh, a lot of it is cultural. Uh, but uh, anybody who sort of you know, says that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take that, I'm, I'm not going to have that, and I'm going to go out and, you know, build a business. Uh, I can cite very successful women entrepreneurs that have built, you know, large businesses in Pakistan. So if they could do that, anybody can do that. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, just a, a broad investment market in Pakistan, I mean, you, you don't want to get me going on that. Uh, that is something that needs a lot of work in general. Uh, to get money into the country and, and invest in you know, businesses, whether they are going to let or not going to let women-led businesses. Uh, that is something that, you know, is perhaps for another debate, another time. Uh, you could, you know, Perfect. 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 Well. Perfect. Uh, Rabil. Sorry, Ahad, you'll have to repeat this specific question. Apologies, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, so uh, basically, I just wanted to know uh, what, in your opinion, is the Pakistani investment market effective uh, in increasing women's economic participation and creating employment? Um, yeah, that's about it, I guess. I think it's uh, it's really an accumulation of some of those uh, initiatives that were mentioned previously um, and that both Kulsum and Khurram have also elaborated on. Uh, absent those initiatives, would we see even less investment in women-led uh, businesses? Absolutely. Um, is enough going in? Absolutely not. Uh, I think, uh, and that's really the the mismatch that we're all um, hoping to try to kind of bridge uh, while uh, again also resp uh, trying to kind of like you know build the businesses and address the fiduciary duties that we all respectively have uh, which in our case for example is um, is to look at uh, commercially um, attractive businesses that can generate also a financial return um, uh, that of course uh, puts uh, the fund in a certain uh, requirement to have to um, like you know fulfill uh, certain criteria for any business to get an investment from us um, however like Kalsum uh, mentioned earlier that it wasn't um, it, it doesn't mean that like you know the only form of financing that is suitable for every single business out there is venture capital funding and certainly when you go into the specific mandates of individual funds, um, it can really um, narrow down the focus area quite a bit. Um, so if you were look, to look at uh, that sort of an analysis, um, maybe the numbers would not speak of um, like, you know, the kind of um, uh, investment we want to see in women-led businesses. Um, however, uh, again, uh, one key aspect is if one business scales, it goes on and raises uh, a lot of uh, capital. And um, so the numbers can also change very quickly. I think one thing that we should probably look at um, and be careful of is, is both to look at the number of businesses uh, which are women led that are getting invested in, but also what total amount of capital uh, that is being raised by those businesses. Uh, I think it, we also don't want to fall um, trap of, um, of checkbox exercises where 
um, a, a particular kind of program backs like you know 20 different um, businesses um, all with an amount which is not enough to have any of them set up a, a proper real business or uh, be able to kind of like achieve any sort of scale so I think those those kind of metrics uh, are probably something we want to be careful with um, but overall I think the the direction of travel certainly seems the right one I think we can certainly um, um, maybe move faster on it uh, and I think we all need to be maybe a little bit we can define our own roles a little bit better um, uh, well, like we individually um, of course uh, like you know can't um, become female I guess like you know in that case so can't really um, understand context uh, ever um, but I think in in whatever capacity we can I think uh, we all need to individually as entities as um, whatever the small players we are in the ecosystem need to just assess where we can maybe um, push that boundary a little bit and and wherever we can um, I'm very happy to even um, like you know, be public about this that like for like um, same business with the same kind of risk and return expectation um, we would maybe want to um, go with a female-led one um, uh, as opposed to uh, a male-led one um, again, like for like, if um, someone puts um, more value um, to like, you know, a particular kind of return or any uh, social impact, et cetera, um, that would be their own funds, uh, individual consideration. Um, in our case, of course, we, we do believe in this and we, we believe it's not at the detriment of returns. Uh, in fact, uh, quite the contrary, um, if it can potentially help returns, we want to be looking for women-led businesses that we could potentially back. But of course, they do need to meet the rest of the criteria that we have within it. And, and I think there are more and more entities and, and people that are thinking that way in the country. Um, and, uh, and so each year, uh, the hope is you're going to see more businesses by number and also uh, more uh, amount of capital um, be diverted towards those businesses. Um, but it will uh, never be fast enough, if you ask me. All right, perfect. Uh, Kilsum, would you? Yeah, I mean, not much more to add. I think they, uh, Rabil and uh, Horam actually addressed it really well. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like I think that, you know, we keep, we're talking about this as if the, the end should always be that, you know, a company is only successful if it's raised VC investment, and that's not true. Um, and I think what's been interesting is uh, Misba, my partner, and I were in Nairobi earlier this year um, with a bunch of funds, actually, from, from frontier markets, but a lot of them based in Africa. Um, and a lot of them that were doing SME investing, which was really interesting, a lot of those SMEs were actually run by, by women. But the type of approach was not a VC approach, and the mandate of those funds was not a VC mandate, right? Those were um, looking at revenue-based financing, it was looking at venture debt. And so the box on market is still early. I do think, again, we just need to have a lot more diversity um, on the side of that. And I, I think the onus should never be that a woman-led company is only as successful as if she's raised funding. I actually think we should really approach it in terms of what does a company need to actually grow. And, and that really is why an ecosystem approach is important. It's not just funders that have to step up and fund women. It's also how, from an ecosystem perspective, what are support players also doing, right, to support women-led companies and, and support all types of companies. So um, yeah, I think it's a complicated issue. It's not just going to be, the ball is not just in the VC court, to be honest, it's, it's across the board. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Kilsum. Uh, so I'd like, uh, in interest of time, I'd like to take more questions from the audience. Um, and let me go around to what we have. Uh, so we have uh, Sophia Masood. Uh, she's saying, hi, Kilsum. Really loved how all, all, all of you identified the inherent gender bias, uh, gender bias and the issue of aspirational framing. Can you talk about how you are helping women entrepreneurs to realize the potential of their ideas? Yeah, thanks, Sophia, for that. Um, 
It's, it's so hard to say that it's something actually tangible, to be honest, um, because so much of it is actually real coaching. So I've personally had an executive coach. I know that, um, you know, personally, what we do with a lot of our founders is so much of it is like I'm kind of a quasi therapist or we're all kind of quasi therapists for our founders in terms of them thinking through the mindset issue of how they frame themselves and frame their companies, how they're talking about what they're doing. Um, so much of it is that type of soft coaching, which ultimately a lot of them have the technical skills, right? And ultimately, when you look at those numbers, that's really important. But at the end of the day, if they don't see themselves that way, um, then it's, that's, it's not going to take them that far. So, so much of it is really about creating um, that type of mindset coaching, which I think is really important. But then also, I think what's been really great, um, and I, I think all programs do this, I know that we really focus on this, uh, is really that cohort-based model of peer learning as well. Um, a lot of times, uh, both men and women, but um, a lot of our female founders really have built like a community where they can depend on each other and rely on each other. And I think that actual support Support, again, is a very soft thing to pinpoint. It's not a very tangible thing for me to say that this is the reason, but I do know that when I've seen um, our companies grow, they've been able to really rely on each other. And I think even as we build out our portfolio from a fund side, um, that becomes important too, is what is the cross learning that can happen um, amongst other female founders with each other. Perfect. Uh, Sophia, I hope that answers your question. Uh, then we have another question from one of our participants and attendees. It's Sidra Naeem. Uh, so Sidra is saying, is it mandatory to go through an incubator phase to reach out to VCs? Or are the VCs on this particular panel discussion equally open to connect it with organic female-led businesses? So if you'd like to go first, we'll see. I think uh, Casey was about to speak, so you you can go yeah. first, and I can go after. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, if you don't go through an incubation center, you'll never get funding. Not only that, you have to get anointed. Um, they have to give you a, a, a bath with uh, water uh, that is sourced from, uh, you know, a tap from uh, the incubation center. Short of that, you can forget about raising funds. <laughs> um, assuming absolutely you're being sarcastic. Not. Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, I think it, it just helps a lot. Uh, yeah, we have all sorts of incubators. Some of them do a fantastic job of scouting entrepreneurs for the investors, uh, preparing them. Earlier, Kuzum had uh, spoken about uh, investor uh, readiness and uh, you know, investable companies becoming investment ready. So they, they help a lot in bridging that gap. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we look at our own uh, stats, for example, um, uh, two out of the six were uh, uh, went through incubation program, others did not. Uh, I don't know, maybe we can just share the stats from our portfolio and that will help answer that question. Yeah. Um, I think that for us too, you know, it, you don't have to, I think at all. If anything, if you've gone out and done it on your own and you weren't jumping from program to program, which I think is actually a real issue in the Pakistan ecosystem, right, is oftentimes we'll see a startup that's actually gone to like five incubators or they've gone to our accelerator and then they went back to an incubator. And I recognize why that's the case in some, some cases, I think because of the overall lack of support, the need for office space, there's reasons behind that. But sometimes that can actually hurt you, I would say, in conversations with investors. Like I see that personally as a red flag. If I see an entrepreneur that's just gone out and won awards and they haven't been executing on their business, like for me, actually, I think it's quite cool when I meet someone who I wouldn't have heard of um, otherwise because of these programs. So the programs are great in terms of creating visibility. Um, I know our accelerator plays a very strong role in its, its sisterhood relationship to our fund. Obviously, that plays a very strong pipeline role, and we get to know our companies better through the accelerator, um, as well as, you know, any other technical assistance that we provide. Um, so it really does help bridge the gap. But if I meet you and I've never met you before and I've never heard of you through any of these programs and you're doing so much, that's actually one of the best signs because it meant you were just working on your company and executing on your business. So uh, don't see not joining an incubator and accelerator as something that would be a detriment for you. Uh, Rabil? Yeah, just wanted to actually belabor this last point that Kulsu mentioned. Um, and this is also, I, I was checking what the exact specific question was, uh, which was um, whether VCs on this panel are uh, equally open to connecting with organic female-led businesses. I want to say we're even more open to that. 
we we prefer those at the risk of um, um, and, and not being very kind to our friends at incubators and accelerators, um, which is if you have managed to build a business, pull together a team, get to a stage without requiring what is considered just a phase, an incubation phase of a business, um, you're probably doing a lot of things very well. And, uh, and we are going to be very interested in speaking to you. Uh, and uh, I think that's just something um, which goes in together with the rest of the considerations of making an investment decision. Uh, and I think uh, having gone through an incubator um, can help in a lot of cases. Um, but like uh, also I think Kalsum uh, alluded to maybe uh, politely, um, it can also hurt in some cases uh, where uh, I think that focus on your own particular business um, might not jive so well with this a structured program of an incubator. So you want to really um, make that decision uh, and, and also determine um, what kind of investment or investors would be the right fit with the kind of financing profile your business will have. And if helping determine that um, um, is, is again enabled by an incubator, uh, I think that would be beneficial for you to go through that phase um, before approaching investors directly. Um, however, if you're making waves, if, um, if you're growing and if you have an attractive business model, um, then uh, we should all be reaching out to you as well yeah. and, and uh, trying to find you. So that's really our job as well. Um, so yeah. no one should ever feel that going through the incubation stage or an incubator formally is a requirement. Yeah. Can I also just add one quick point? I, had, I just was remembering something that I wanted to say earlier as well. Because um, even with the data that we've collected, a lot of women in the ecosystem have raised money, but it's not necessarily VC money, right? And it actually speaks to, there's been a lot of grant opportunities specifically for female-led companies, and that's good and bad. So number one, it's good because there's been opportunities for women that um, may not necessarily have qualified for VC level of investment to be able to find opportunities to continue to grow their business. So awards and grants play a role in that. But then the detriment of that is that grants obviously come with their own issue, right? So you have to fit, you know, it's almost like fitting a square peg in a round hole in terms of changing your business to actually be able to match what the grant is looking for. And so oftentimes that means that even though eventually you want to raise VC money and that grant can help you get there because it's high risk, no return capital in that value chain for you raising money, oftentimes it detracts and takes you away from that path. And so I do think it's really important because I think from a support program perspective, so to this point, um, I also think it's a really important role Role for incubators and accelerators to play that role in terms of helping entrepreneurs understand what opportunities are out there for them. But if in the future they do want to raise that type of money, how they need to position themselves for a future round. So not to the question that was right now, but I do think that's a really important thing for, for female-led companies and for any entrepreneur to understand. Uh, you, you're right, and soon thanks for sharing that, uh, and I'm glad that you did remember this and <laughs> shared it with the audience. So uh, we have another question uh, from Furkan Qureshi. So what he says is, uh, Karandas is funds women with entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs with three years in business. Uh, will you fund women entrepreneurs with one or two years of business standing? So I don't know if who's it directed towards. So, but which one would you like to go first? Um. I don't know, it might be a requirement of uh, a particular program, but uh, I do know for a fact that Karanda has funded businesses that have not been in business for three years. In fact, businesses that have just been started uh, recently. So it might be a programmatic requirement uh, because um, it's a, you know, it, we keep experimenting, right? Um, because uh, the mandate specifically is to scout and fund women entrepreneurs, um, I think we're in a, mode of constant experimentation to figure out you know what's the best way to to fund women entrepreneurs so we might have done a cohort where we said okay let's try funding companies that have had two or three years of experience uh, then we've done a cohort where that requirement is not there we might have done an industry specific cohort we might have done like an education specific cohort so a lot of that is just experiments that are uh, programmatic attributes of a particular program there are multiple programs that keep getting designed and executed at Karanda. So um, I, I, yeah, to answer the question, absolutely. Uh, for, the, for the 
right kind of business, right opportunity. Uh, it's definitely fun. In fact, on the equity side, where the, the big money is, there's no such requirement. Uh, we've had, we have actually funded absolutely greenfield projects uh, from the CIC side of Kandas, uh, which are much larger tickets, anywhere from two to $5 million. So uh, yeah, it, it could just be a program feature that uh, Fukan is talking about. Thank you so much, Kolam, uh, for the clarification. Uh, and I mean, it's amazing getting uh, greenfield businesses up and funded. Uh, so yeah, uh, would you like to answer this as well, Kalsoom uh, or Rabi? Yeah, I mean, I think Furkan specifically spoke about Garandas. I mean, we're definitely open to um, making seed or pre-seed investments in companies that might not have been around. I mean, I think we like to typically see about a year and some traction, but yeah, we're completely open to that. And for us, because we have, uh, you know, our we have an accelerator team and we also have a research team, we actually have a lot of hands and realize that we like to get our hands dirty with the companies that we invest in and, and like to roll up our sleeves alongside our entrepreneurs. So so um, we definitely bring that um, with us when we invest early in a company. Yeah, on our side, similarly, we don't have any requirements. Uh, I think it's really driven by stage uh, of investment. Uh, our stage is, is more um, seed, maybe even kind of post seed through to series A uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so it's it's really about like you know what support uh, businesses require at that stage um, and um, and if um, there are we believe that there are players in the ecosystem that could be great partners for some of these businesses that also focus on an earlier stage. Um, I would love to mention also I to I being one of them, um, uh, which which also again works. Um, uh, in the sense that like, you know, not all of us can do all of the things or, or try to help in all of the ways that we would want to. Um, but uh, I think sometimes um, it helps if, um, if there's a bunch of different um, mentors around entrepreneurs um, so that they can maybe pick on them for whatever respective guidance they need. Uh, and, and I think uh, like, you know, the more we have, again, businesses, that are making their progress through different stages, the more um, confidence uh, other female entrepreneurs are going to have. Um, and, uh, and I think more and more financing providers will come up which will not have uh, any stringent requirements and, and uh, will diversify potentially the sources of funding that a business can go for. Uh, so Again, a little bit of a tangent from the specific question, but since uh, I'm not too familiar with the Karandas requirements, uh, I could only speak to what we look at as a fund. Uh, perfect, thank you. Uh, so and thank you for answering that, uh, Rabi. Uh, um, so we have another pa um, participant who's uh, asking all the panelists, uh, how do you think the future looks like uh, post COVID for uh, MSMEs in Pakistani scenario? Uh, will we see a shift in funding priorities? And if yes, what would be the areas that attract most funding? Oh man, do I wish I could predict that. So I, I'm not going to take a stab at that. <laughs> Rabin, <laughs> let's, let's you a lot smarter than me. <laughs> I don't think any of us know what it's going to look like. I think um, we did do research. Uh, so we released a briefing on the impact of COVID on, on the space, but that was maybe four weeks into uh, four weeks into the pandemic. And so actually, um, even though we're really swamped at eye to eye, we probably should do a, a follow up on what's being what's happening. But I think obviously we saw that globally, as well as in Pakistan, at least in the beginning, and I'm seeing this shift right now is that um, a lot of us as funders, uh, were in a bit of a holding pattern, just kind of seeing, you know, making sure our portfolio companies were first taken care of that we had a reserve in place. But then we've obviously seen deals happen, right? So I mean, we saw that uh, Bazaar got investment, Thadjar got investment, um, the VIA announced their investment. And so we're seeing certain sectors really come up and that are exciting. And so what we're seeing globally is, as well as in Pakistan, as we're seeing ed tech becoming something that can um, withstand in a very smart way, uh, it, supposedly, um, the pandemic. Uh, we're seeing health tech really come up and change the landscape. I know that KZ's obviously invested in a health tech company as well. And, um, you know, 
and obviously Ribiel's invested in an ed tech company. Um, and then, you know, for us, for companies that are in essential services, right? So this is really where the buzz is happening for the B2B for Guyana stores. And we're seeing people that are in uh, delivery and e-commerce around essential services, which is what the is doing, which Rebeal and Sermaya Car invested in. So I think we're seeing certain sectors come up. And I think that is really exciting and really interesting. Um, I've, I've talked about this in webinars that we've hosted at eye to eye. Um, for those who are not necessarily in sectors or sectors that are very adversely impacted by COVID, um, I would probably try to wait out raising money right now just because you will be adversely impacted even from a valuation perspective or even your power at the negotiation table. But for people that are in spaces that really can, um, can really jump off this, uh, I mean, we've invested in a localized messenger platform that's doing really, really well right now because everyone's at home and bored, right? So everyone's on the messenger. And so um, I think the bigger thing for investors to think about or what we're all thinking about is what's going to hold after all of this is over what things can we predict about uh, the stickiness of customers in terms of you know we'll see a lot of people be able to get customers in the door because of things being a little bit weird but then as we shift into what the quote-unquote new normal looks like who's going to stay on these platforms I think fintech is going to be really interesting for this right is like how do we actually design for the new world that's going to be happening because we're not going to go back to normal after this so yeah, I don't know if Rabiel, you also have thoughts. I'm I'm going to start by mentioning Kilsum is a is a brave woman um, because what I say is like predicting um, these areas or these things in our line of work is like risking a potential NAB inquiry in the future, or again our line of work. Um, I think what uh, I would probably I can't add much uh, to what Kilsum said, but. I think there's certain um, trends or certain um, consequence or effects of uh, COVID, which one um, does need to take into account if um, uh, one aspires to be an entrepreneur in Pakistan, which will um, uh, require, um, like the business will require capital. So I think uh, what we're going to see potentially is a little bit more of a focus on on really quality businesses, which can also visibly like, you know, demonstrate a path to profitability, which does not rely on extended rounds of external funding, um, because it's just going to be harder to raise that fund. Uh, and, and I think the quality names are probably going to see a lot of interest, uh, meaning that if there is a business which is uh, generating or is likely to generate attractive unit economics, is seeing traction, in a market where I believe we're going to see an acceleration um, of take up rather than any sort of deceleration from COVID. Um, so businesses that are able to, again, effectively match um, that demand with whatever solution they're providing uh, and be efficient in, in capturing that market share uh, are going to also attract a lot of uh, attention from investors. Um, so, so businesses that um, are, like, you know, tied to or are targeting some of the spaces that Kulsum mentioned um, are likely to be beneficiaries from this space um, or from COVID. But it still remains to be seen um, how those businesses are ex or ideas are executed upon. And, uh, and if um, the actual economics that are being generated by them are attractive, um, then I think those businesses shouldn't really see much of an impact or at least not a negative impact from, from COVID. In fact, it, it probably will bring them more attention um, if, if they are getting things right, because um, there's just more capital now in the country than there was, or at least focused uh, on the country than there was a year or two years ago. And uh, I think um, all of our respective funds also need a place um, to get allocated. So, so it's not like we're not looking um, at investing. Uh, I think it's just a question of the bar is going to be a little bit higher from our side. And, um, and I think the businesses that do clear it, um, uh, there's going to be potentially a rush towards getting into those businesses. Uh, yeah. 
And we have to make the argument to, for those of us that are institutional funds, we have to make the argument to our LPs and to people who are funding us about why we're making the bets that we are right now, right? I think that's a big important point. And one thing that I think is really important as two data points that came out in our research at the time, maybe this was like, again, a month into the pandemic, um, was that 74% of the companies that we, and we'd interviewed about, I think we surveyed about over 100, about 102, 74% um, of them had not created an alternative product offering in the market, but then actually also a significant number of them had only about three months of runway, uh, one to three months of runway. So for me, what I think is really important is beyond the sectors is also looking at the founders. Um, and I think what's it's the type of founders that investors want to invest in at this point are the ones who are going to be the most adaptive, the ones that are going to iterate their businesses and change things and adjust to the new reality within reason, like not completely changing your business, but um, really adjusting to what we're seeing in the market. And I think that those are signs of good founders, right? And I think the type of stress level that's right now really kind of comes out the type of characteristics that, you know, us as investors want to invest in. Perfect. Uh, so I have a very simple question from Sabha Farooq. Uh, what she wants to know is how does she connect with you? With who? All of us? All of us. <laughs> with all three of you. So um would you guys like to answer it or should I just should i be the one just answering it for you sure well, in our case there's a website 47.ventures there's a page that says contact us just click on that <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say that, you know, social media, feel free to reach out on Twitter uh, to me personally, but then also um, because oftentimes I think we're all getting a lot of personal messages that we can all address. Uh, our email for, and I'll put it in the chat, is ventures at invest innovate.com. So send a message there and that's how our team uh, gets back to any queries about investment. I'll just say um, all the enterprising founders figure out a way of uh, reaching the right people and the decision makers at the right places. Um, so I will encourage everyone to continue doing that. Uh, and uh, one, I guess, tip is also, um, it, it shows a certain uh, resourcefulness uh, on part of an entrepreneur. If you're also able to identify, again, whose opinion or, or, uh, or view is valued by uh, different investors. So something that, uh, again, like, you know, an avenue into uh, getting through to the right people. But uh, all uh, information, I think, for all the, our firms is uh, publicly available. Our websites are marakar.com or um, any of the social media handles. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time, uh, this is going to be the last question. So Amna Shahab says, uh, to truly empower women, Policymakers need to address constraints. University of Sussex uh, proposes two elements of change. Uh, consciousness uh, needs to be shifted, changing internalized constraints and barriers that hold women back. The second, cultural beliefs about gender and power must be challenged. Uh, how can the government of Pakistan help in making this shift take place? Uh, I'll ask Kunam Sam to answer this question first since uh, you're on the board of a lot of government entities and have been advising them. <laughs> yeah, right now I just want them to save our lives. That's about it. Not worry about anything else. If they can do that, I'm sure there are lots of Good luck with that. challenges <laughs> that uh, the government can address. I agree. So they agree. Um, Rabil, do you have any comments on this? <laughs> yeah. Very loaded uh, question, and I I don't feel like uh, very well kind of like in a position uh, to respond. I think I think it's uh, government focus again. We all have seen like you know what has been the most important thing over the last uh, uh, couple of months, uh, and and I think that is really the most important thing. Uh, I think we need to just be mindful that um, we we all should try continue to try to. Uh, do our little bits and uh, in inshallah things uh, are going to return to uh, like you know some sort of uh, normalcy even though we shouldn't call it normalcy I think it'll mm -hmm. just be like in a new state in which um, uh, we are and and I think the government um, is certainly um, uh, aware and and the intent might even be there I think the, the gap is um, that um, the bureaucracy and the setup sometimes is such that 
uh, it doesn't incentivize anyone to push uh, the envelope uh, too much. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong phrase to use with Pakistani government push the envelope. <laughs> Um, push the boundary uh, with respect to some of these things because it really takes uh, someone um, um, to do that, right? And like you know, you need to be a kind of kind of like a spirit that pierces through, um, um, but because with, without really any corresponding incentives, uh, at least in the immediate term, it, you can you understand a little bit why it takes so long for things to also move along, but. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things which just require to be fixed, even if we don't apply specifically the uh, female-led founder lens. Um, for example, just facilitate getting investment into the country mm -hmm. um, you know, from funds like ours, uh, which will overall increase uh, funding. And I think if you just have the same percentage flowing to female-led businesses, you're just going to have a greater amount. Simple, mm -hmm. um, no complex math involved in that. But I think with each one playing our own roles as well, I think there will be greater acceptance um, of, uh, of female-led businesses that should actually be backed and, and believed in. And part of that, uh, which I also noticed was one of the questions, how do we change really the cultural uh, mindset? And I think it starts from ourselves. It starts from our homes. It starts from um, the people that are uh, around us and, um, and uh, continuing to um, like you know, back some of those. Um, I mean, we we sometimes also misplace um, uh, uh, like you know how people think about like uh, females uh, when it comes to um, their own daughters versus uh, someone outside. And I just want to share like you know an, an anecdote. I hope I don't uh, get into trouble for this. Um, um, as you know, like you know, the Maimans are a very uh, successful. Uh, community in in Pakistan, business community in Pakistan, and and um, like you know, oftentimes uh, when like one gives an example of like you know businesses that are run with a certain mindset, which is not really um, uh, does not jive with um, what we like to claim is like you know this modern venture capital mindset um, of like you know taking smaller stakes, etc. Um, it doesn't necessarily translate across in every avenue. Um, I think one of the areas where we still see a lot of bias against women is in specifically venture capital funding. Um, uh, however, uh, coming back to the example I was sharing, um, at, uh, uh, at an event where um, Akil Karim uh, Derisa, like, you know, who's one of uh, the most successful kind of mamans around, um, and, and he was asked what was the secret of his own success or what he believed really would be the secret of um, Pakistan's future. And all he spoke about was, um, was women and empowering um, women and enabling them to go out and make a difference. And um, he mentioned um, his own example of how uh, he was uh, quite proud of his, uh, his daughters and not so much um, of, his, uh, of his sons uh, in being able to build um, uh, like, you know, and uh, continue to grow the empire that he has set up. Now, this, again, just represents um, what we might believe um, is like, you know, a general kind of like, you know, perception or belief held widely around. But I think each one of us needs to think about ourselves and our own um, uh, notions and, and how we might be believing certain things and acting as a different way. And if we can start addressing that and then start addressing that within our firms, um, and within our funds, um, and then hopefully within the businesses that are backed by us, uh, I think that's where it will have really hopefully that meaningful longer term impact that also sustains. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, on the government issue, I think uh, everyone in government should follow KZ on Twitter. I think his he has some really great threads on what government should do based on like some of the issues that he's faced from a fund perspective. So definitely my, my form of information on, on what's going on. Um, I think also to Rebiel's point, um, when we're talking about inclusion, even personally, I think that um, oftentimes we look outwards and we point fingers and we're like, they're not doing this, they're not doing that, but we're not looking inwards and actually interrogating ourselves and saying, are we being as inclusive as possible, right? And I think even with, um, you know, Ms. Ben and I obviously are running a female-led VC fund. We don't only invest in women, but obviously we could just rest on that, right? And that's not enough even. So even though we are a female-led fund, that doesn't necessarily mean that unconscious bias still does not um, 
um, rest with us as well. So we also have to continue to interrogate ourselves in terms of, are we being as inclusive as possible in our pipeline and our sourcing and how we scout deals and how we talk to, talk to our founders, right? And I, I think we're doing a pretty good job, but we have to con continuously ask those questions of ourselves if we're going to be asking questions of others. And I think that's really important um, in terms of moving forward when we talk about being more inclusive, all of us, is to first look inwards and address those issues. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kulsum, for answering that in detail, and Rabil and Khurum Saab. Uh, thank you for coming on the panel. Uh, thank you for talking about uh, all the different challenges. Thank you for answering all the different questions that we have had to ask. Uh, thank you for giving your time. Um, and that's about it from the talk today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Love this.